But first, first a little an apology. Um, this presentation is down in the program as being co-presented by Martin and G3's LAY. We only got back from Mickle on about this time last week. So uh, this has been a rather hastily put together presentation and it just worked out easier if um, only one of us was, were doing it. Uh, we didn't really have very much time. So uh, apologies that you've, only, you've got to put up with my voice for the next 45 minutes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what was your voice again? <laughs> So, as I say, um, we spent most of the week before last uh, on, on Miquelon. Where is Miquelon? Miquelon is uh, an island just to the south of Newfoundland, uh, off the eastern coast of Canada. And uh, the main, it's actually two islands, so Saint Pierre and Miquelon. Uh, Saint Pierre is the smaller island, which has a population of roughly 6,000. Uh, that's because it's got the better harbour. Then this Long Island is jointly known as Miquelon Long Lad. Uh, Long Lad being that bit and Miquelon being that bit. Uh, but they are joined together. Our operating QTH was uh, up where that big arrow is um, on the northern tip of Miquelon. And uh, that's for reasons that will be described in a moment. So a bit of history about Miquelon. Um, and San Pierre Miquelon in fact. Um, these are two islands that for a long time were squabbled over by Britain and France. In 1815, uh, following uh, the death of Napoleon, um, France eventually took over the islands and they have been French ever since. Uh, they, they are not part of Quebec and, uh, the French, and the people, the inhabitants there who are French citizens are very proud of the fact that they speak proper French and not the bastardised version that the friends down the St. Lawrence Passage uh, tend to speak. So, uh, this is actually part of France, and uh, main industries there, obviously fishing for most of the 19th century. Then uh, in 1920s, 1930s, prohibition in the United States. This was a smuggler's paradise for getting alcohol into the States. Uh, nice bit of France, just helpfully just off the coast. Um, ever since then, it's, it's had a, a rather turbulent history and basically is going through a bit of bad times at the moment. There is the possibility of um, oil nearby, but France, a few years ago in an uh, international court ruling, lost a lot of the sea territory that it was claiming around, around the islands. So um, that may or may not happen. So, so a, lot of it, a lot of their reliance is on tourism, although it's not exactly the easiest place to get to. So why did we go there? Three reasons. Our information. First of all, it's the XCC entity. Uh, it's the XCC entity and it's an iota. So uh, lots and lots of people <coughs> want GSOs. It's fairly regularly activated. It's not super rare. But on the other hand, it's because of how propagation has been for the last few years, there were lots of people wanting it, especially on the higher bands. Second reason was the motel. The motel pictured uh, the big long building in the second picture there. So the Motel de Miquelon is the most ham radio friendly place you could ever go to. Um, it's a wonderful resource and most importantly there is a big ham radio store cupboard full of equipment. So you can just basically turn up, you need to take some stuff with you, we'll cover some of that later. Um, but there's a lot of stuff already there, you don't need to ship out containers in advance. <laughs> <laughs> Third reason, Santa Claus. More precisely, um, Mountain uh, G3's LAY had been to Miquelon twice before. And uh, last Christmas, he uh, got a marketing Christmas card from the motel saying they hoped that he would be back soon. So uh, this was justification enough. It was about the time we were wondering what to do for our next uh, Cambridge University Wireless Society trip. So uh, having had this invitation, we thought it's about time that we took a larger group out to Miquelon. So how do you get to San Pierre Miquelon? Well, in the summer, there is a, very usefully, a Air Canada flight directly from Heathrow to St. John's. So that's fairly easy, except that summer schedule finished whilst we were out there, so we couldn't come back that way. So flying out there was easy, Heathrow to St. John's, and then Air San Pierre operates a plane from uh, this ATR, from uh, St. John's to St. Pierre. And then for getting to Miquelon, 
the plan had been to use a small Cessna. Uh, so basically, SMPA have a Cessna, and even if things aren't on the schedules and the flight doesn't really exist, if there's enough of you, it, it can happen. Um, so after a few email exchanges and a little bit of worry on Martin's part about, about, about rising from the fact we didn't actually have tickets or anything like that, we um, had the plan to go on Cessna. Unfortunately, September, Northwest Atlantic, weather isn't exactly reliable. And uh, this, is the, this, is, this is actually when we were leaving, exactly the same situation when we went there, uh, it was too foggy for the Cessna to fly. Uh, we got to San Piero Cay, it's the ILS runway, but couldn't take off in the Cessna and get over to Miquelon. So uh, the other option was taking the boat. So uh, we, uh, so fortunately the French government subsidised a very nice boat, so you can, that can actually get across to, uh, to, to Long Island. But this did mean we had an unscheduled uh, stop overnight in Saint Pierre itself on the way out. Once we eventually got to Long Island, um, the boat couldn't land at Long Island. So we had to transfer everything, including us, into these Zodiacs and uh, a little bit of ferrying backwards and forwards, uh, se several, several back and forwards trips to get everything across to Long Island. And then uh, we all jumped in the back of a pickup truck and uh, sitting in the back of the pickup truck, you'll see later, we uh, had a very fun journey all the way up through Long Land and into Michelin itself. So I've said we several times. Who is we? Um, running top left to top right is Martin GCZAY, Simon G4EAG, myself, Rob M0VFC, who's there. Um, Tom M0TOC, who was here yesterday and isn't here now, and uh, Gavin M1BXF. So there were six of us all together on the trip. And um, so that, that's who we were. Foxtrot Papa, so Golf 3, Zulu Alpha, Yankee, QRZ. Mike 0, Victor, Foxtrot Charlie. Mike 0, Victor, Foxtrot Charlie, 5-9. Five 5-9, nine. Five nine, thank you. Foxtrot Papa, so Golf 3, Zulu Alpha, Yankee, QRZ. Mike Zero, Bravo Lima Foxtrot. Mike Zero, Bravo Lima Foxtrot, 5 9. Yeah, you're also 5 9, but I haven't got your call. Okay, the, the, the purpose of these audio recordings will, um, will come, come clear later on. So, anyway, the, the stations we were using in, uh, in Mithilon. Um, we had to, because we had the possibility of going in the Cessna, although we didn't eventually use it, we had to travel fairly lightly. Um, Air Saint Pierre were wonderful. They said if you were in the Cessna and you had too much luggage, you could bring everything out for the following day or the next flight. Wasn't a problem, but um, we we wanted to travel fairly light. So, as I say, fortunately, a lot of equipment was already out there. So we basically didn't need to worry too much about the antennas. Uh, the stations we took ourselves: uh, an IC706, a Ellicraft K3. IC7000 and an FT450. Uh, two of the stations had amplifiers. Um, one of the amplifiers was already in Michelon at the motel. The other one we took out with us, um, a small, uh, fairly large homebrew amplifier that uh, had been made by a friend in Cambridge. Um, you probably, if you heard a song, you might be aware we were using six different call signs. We were all operating under our own call signs. And uh, I realized this might have been a bit odd. So the reason for this was we had been told by the Icelandic licensing authorities back in 2005, they pointed out to us that it isn't, illegal, it isn't legal to use club call signs under CEPT. So we couldn't use the G60W call sign uh, under CEPT. So another option, of course, might have been to just use one of our call signs, but it turns out you can't do that under CEPT either or at least not under the French interpretation of CEPT. Another option might have been to get a special event call sign, but FP special event call signs are no longer issued, and the only ones you can get are Tango Oscar prefixes, which could be anywhere. So the easiest solution to say that we were obviously in Saint-Pierre was for us all to use our own call signs, even if that did confuse people a little bit. So I've mentioned the, um, mentioned the Motel de Micron's uh, stash of equipment. Uh, this is some of it that the uh, owner of the motel found on our third day. Uh, she sort of um, came out running out to us one lunchtime and said, I found a load more equipment. And uh, this is what she'd found. Um, 
Underneath one of the bedrooms, there's a big load of fiberglass poles, um, scaffolding, aluminium tubes, everything you might need to put up antennas. Um, everything, uh, there's another sort of walk-in cupboard thing with shelving units which had the amplifier in it and sort of all, other, all sorts of other things. Um, there, there is a list which is maintained by visitors who, who go to the island of exactly what's there, we think. Um, having said that, shortly after this photo was taken, um, the manageress of the motel uh, said, actually, you should come down to the bar cellar. So we went down to the bar cellar, and typical bar cellar, lots of pipe work, cooling units, everything like that, sort of um, all in front of you. And there was sort of some shelves, and sort of behind all this, there was some bits of metal. So uh, we sent Rob in to sort of crawl past all the pipe work behind the bar um, and uh, find what was there. It was only a, a six uh, a six meter beam and also a satellite antenna for two and seventy cents. So uh, there, there's all sorts of stuff there. We're, we're still working on finalising inventory, um, but it, it makes operating from there fantastic. Lima Foxtrot, Charlie, QRZ. Lima Foxtrot, Lima Foxtrot. Lima Foxtrot, type 9. Lima Foxtrot, Lima Foxtrot. Yeah, the Lima Foxtrot, type 9. Ah, thank you. From Mike Zero, Bravo, Lima Foxtrot. You're 59, 59, from Mike Zero, Bravo, Lima Foxtrot. Yeah, M0, VLF, thanks, 59, QRZ. Okay. Thank you for So, um... We, we managed to make a fair few QSOs while we were out there. Uh, just a small poll, put your hands up if you managed to work us. Wow, that's fantastic. Great, okay. I work hard. <laughs> 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 I, I noticed Rob put his hand up as well. I'm always asking about that one. Um, so, yeah, uh, conditions were fantastic. Um, we were very fortunate when we were there. Um, the solar activity was excellent, and the top bands did really well. We had openings on 10 and 12, better than I can remember them since the last solar maximum. Um, really great. We had some fantastic DX as well. There was one VK4 who emailed us in advance of us going and said he was been trying for ages and ages to make a QSO on 12 and 10. We didn't manage to make the QSO with him from to VK4 on 10 meters, but we did manage 12 meters, which is just about antipodes from. Um, uh, from FP and uh, also a good opening for JA just after uh, our dawn, sort of around 10 Zulu on 40 meters. Um, Martin had some nice JA CW power labs, so uh, really, really great conditions. Um, no major problems with Aurora. Uh, there were um, a couple, couple of times when there was a bit of fluttering around, but generally it was it was excellent. <laughs> Patricia, uh, the lady here, uh, is the manageress of the Motel de Mickey Bob, and she is amazing. Uh, the most helpful owner of a motel you've ever come across. She not only massaged Rob while he was operating, but also, um, you know, we phoned in advance and tried, tried to sort of sort out some of the arrangements for us going. And we said we're going to be bringing a fair bit of radio equipment with us. We don't really want to bring a whole week's worth of clothes. Is there sort of a laundrette nearby? Oh, no problem, just give me all your dirty washing and I'll have it done. Sure enough, we gave her dirty washing one night and went into the bath, gave her a dirty laundry bag. Next morning, we had everything ironed and folded for us. Um, she, before we got out there, one of the previous groups had left um, a fiberglass fishing pole with a, uh, dipole, a, a vertical for 40 and 15 up. And uh, the hurricanes that come up from the Caribbean tend to go up the eastern seaboard and sort of fairly close hits on San Pierre Miquelon. And we were a bit concerned. Again, the same phone call talk, asking about the laundry. Oh, he said, is, is this thing still up? Because we knew it had been left up. Is it, is it okay? Oh yeah, uh, one of the sections, top sections has collapsed, but it's no problem. I've already been out and I've um, loop, uh, tightened up all the guys for you, uh, so it's, it's all stable. How, how many motels would do that? <laughs> uh, absolutely brilliant. And uh, um, we hope she's going to still be there. Um, we, we gather that there is potential, uh, she's about to have her contract up for renewal. 
Um, she doesn't actually own the motel. Um, if she goes, it will be a great loss to the hobby. Um, but hopefully whatever happens, the motel will still be available for amateur radio and the cupboard will still be there. Americans already who've been out there before us. There's another group going out, we think, to CQ Worldwide. Checking that, yeah. Um, so they're, they're fairly used to us, but uh, for some reason, well, our particular expedition, because there were six of us, they never had quite that many people. We broke the record for the number of vertical antennas lined up along the beach. We had eight. Um, so th they were quite excited, and uh, the local TV company decided they would come and pay us a visit. Toute cette semaine, les radios amateurs étaient basés à Luton. Six ex-étudiants britanniques de l'Université de Cambridge voilà, ont grandi. Ça, ça, comme un voyage virtuel de quelques secondes en Australie, en Tasmanie ou ailleurs, grâce aux ondes positives de l'archipel. C'est une vraie grande publicité pour le hobby. Nous étions vraiment très heureux qu'ils aient pris cet intérêt. Ils sont venus, ils ont passé deux heures ou trois avec nous. And uh, okay, we meant our QSO totals fell off for one afternoon, um, but it was it was really really great to, to see that and to have that sort of um, have that sort of publicity and that interest from the locals. Where was that shown? Was that just local television there? That that was local television there, but it is also on the France Television website nationally. Um, so the, the equipment, um, I said we were mainly using verticals uh, lined up along the beach. Um, we found they worked really really well. Um, we didn't actually have too many problems with them either. Um, one, of the, one of the antennas actually was a stepper vertical, uh, which had been left by a previous group. So there's still one up on the beach if anyone wants to go and use it. Um, but the others are all, um, the, the, the others we put up fiberglass um, poles. As you see, uh, one of them <coughs> didn't work, wasn't, wasn't very happy. Um, we, we had <coughs> very problems on 80 meters, and that, that was our main problem band. We had lots of local noise. Um, S7, which was really a big struggle for us. And the antenna, as you see, fell over um, and broke. We also made a few mistakes. Um, we might have got the wrong leg of the dipole at one point and ended up having a, the dipole, one leg of the dipole along the ground and one the radials up in the air. Um, <laughs> So but that, that, that may be why, why it didn't work too well. Um, actually, it, the ground there, the, the dry cobble sort of beach, was so perfectly bad as an earth that it was perfect on the, on the um, mini VNC. It, even when the wrong radial was, radial was up and the dipole leg was down. So uh, that, was, that was interesting. But we also had, had another potentially more serious problem. Tom M0 TOC had actually gone ahead of us um, to, to visit family and he's a train buff so he, he wanted to take a very very long train journey all the way up through New England to Montreal and then all the way across to St. John's, uh, several several hours of train journey. But whilst he was in Montreal unfortunately uh, someone decided to take a knife to his bag, slit it open and remove two of our power supply units. Completely useless out there of course because it's 110 volts but we still had this email from Tom about two days before the rest of us left saying 
I'd lost these two power supply units, so uh, Martin had to do a very quick trip down to Martin Link to uh, find some replacements on the way to Heathrow. Um, the other problem we had, and I don't want to dwell on this too much, um, really focused at CW operators. I personally am not a great CW op. Uh, I can quite happily have an exchange with you. I quite happy to exchange call signs and quite happy to exchange serial numbers. I'm really bad at pileups and my enthusiasm for the mode isn't great enough to want, make me want to go and operate and then do pileups better. In previous trips that's been fine. CQ call, a couple of people come back to me, tick them off one by one, <coughs> gentle feed through of people. Once you start getting spotted and people start coming then I couldn't hand over to another operator or something like that. And that didn't happen on this trip. And the reason it didn't happen was the reverse beacon network. One CQ call gets spotted immediately, 40 people try to call me. I can't cope with that. Um, and it was a really big problem. Um, so I was the only person who was prepared to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to try and work the EU dawn shift, the EU dawn opening on 80 metres. And I was going back to bed five minutes later just because I couldn't cope with pileups. So, as I say, I don't want to dwell on that, but um, CW Ops might like to think about that as something that maybe needs fixing. I'm all for technical innovation, but it shouldn't make our lives harder. Um, <laughs> the other thing we were able to do whilst we were there was actually help the locals. Um, this is uh, Jean-Pierre FP5CJ, if I remember rightly. Um, he has a, a nice... Uh, shack in, um, in the centre of Saint-Pierre. He actually shared it with the next door neighbour who's also licensed, and they sort of have a shared tower between their houses. Um, but Jean-Pierre's uh, daikon for 40 metres had sort of gone that way up uh, in a storm, and uh, so he's not been able to use 40 metres. So on our way back from the islands, uh, Rob decided uh, that safety gear wasn't required, and uh, he would quickly uh, shimmy his way up the mast. And, uh, and, and, and push the uh, push the light around and, uh, and come back down fairly quickly again. So um, so we were able to help Jean Pierre. Uh, it was fantastic. Jean Pierre's wife came out to take a group photo when Rob was there, not realising. Jean Pierre's uh, wife came out to take a group photo when we were there not realising Rob was up on the mast and said, oh everyone get together, there's six of you and she took the phone and there's not six of you, where is he? <laughs> but, but no, it was, it was great to be able to help, help one of the local hands like that, um, particularly given, given all the help we'd had from the motel. The other thing we did was we had a social media strategy. Um, social media strategies are rightly um, over a time. Yeah, uh, there, there are lots of people who will claim that social media strategies are good and there's lots of people who are completely wrong about that. But we've been using social media on our activations for quite a while. In 2007, the CWS trip was, we think, the first the expedition on Twitter. Back when Twitter was still something that only geeks knew about. Um, and in, I think it was 2009, when we were in Portugal, was the first time that I was live video blogging on YouTube during the activation so people could actually um, watch what we were doing as we were there. Um, this time we decided to turn it into a strategy and we had two firm objectives for this. The first thing is there are lots of VHF based radio hams around Cambridge who aren't really HFTXs, we wanted to get them involved. Second thing is Rob and I work in the same software company. We're, statistically we're probably pretty good for the number of radio hams. We've got um, out of employee, total employees of 230 we have four licensed people but we have an awful lot more geeks who probably could be good radio hams. So we wanted to get them involved as well. So we actually set up a, a whole strategy on how we were going to be using Facebook, Twitter and YouTube during the activation so that people who don't have licenses uh, could get involved and so that people who are only VHF operators could be involved. So one of the things we did was we um, set up, in the 10 days prior to leaving, a quiz and um, local hams could actually answer the questions in the quiz. The only way to um, enter it was by making an SSB QSO with us. So we had all these VHF types around Cambridge watching our Twitter stream, 
um, answering these questions and the only way they could give us the answer was they had to make an SSP QSO with us and we got <coughs> lots of the VHF types around Cambridge making QSOs with us as a result. Likewise, as a result of the stuff we were putting on Facebook and Twitter, I've had loads of people come up to me at work, and I suspect Rob has as well, since we've been back, saying things like, so how do you send out QSL cards? Do you, do you send them through the post and does it cost loads of money? You know, these people a week ago didn't know what a QSL card was, and they, they've, sort of been able to, they've been exposed to it and they're learning about it. So now the next stage is that probably in the next few weeks, Rob and I will put on a presentation at work about Ham Radio um, and then lead us into a foundation course. So that's, we actually had a strategy, we were using these, these tools available to us during the expedition to try and raise the promotion um, and promote amateur radio. And as I said, the other thing we were doing was, um, we did it less than I wanted, um, video blogs every day explaining what we were doing each day. The reason it was less than we wanted was that we were doing video editing on my laptop which ended up logging on one of the stations, and so we had to take the station off there to do the editing, um, which wasn't ideal. But uh, this is the sort of thing we were putting up. The G expedition began when we flew to St. Pierre Airport on the evening of the 23rd of September 2011. We had intended to fly to a Yeah, Roger, Roger, Yeah, there, there might be a bit of there, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway um, you know, this, this was video was on YouTube about two hours after that QSO. Um, it took me an hour to edit the video maybe, and our colleagues saw that and it was a really great way of showing them what we were doing on, the, on our time off work. <coughs> and I seriously recommend to any of the expedition that you, you investigate doing this sort of thing. Golf 3, Zulu Alpha Yankee, you guys Yeah, so, so um, that, that's the last of those audio clips. Um, you might have gathered by now, this was the, the operating styles and the practices that really annoyed us when you're trying to work with Pyro Up. And uh, we didn't want to name and shame anyone, so uh, we took some time on, on two meters SSB uh, during last week and uh, pretended to be on FP and uh, between the three of us we, we just recorded those. Um, obviously I'm preaching for the converted here, but um, it's, it's really, really frustrating any of these operating styles when you're, when you're working in Pyro Up. Um, so how did we do? Well, we made a, a fair number of QSOs. These numbers um, are out of wind test. We, because we were using six different call signs, um, and wind test is designed for contest, we, these numbers are all excluding the dupes, i.e. people who work different people on, different, on the same band, the same mode. So the numbers are actually higher than these, but, but this is uh, the breakdown of uh, the number of QSOs we made. As you see there, excluding dupes just short of 15,000, uh, the actual QSO total was 17,520. We had worked people in 124 different DXCC entities, 9,272 different call signs in the log, and uh, there were 74 people who managed to work all of the six operators. So um, that was really great, and uh, we really appreciated all those QSOs. And as I say, I mean, first time in years I, since I can remember that we've done the expedition and had over a thousand QSOs on, on those top two bands. Fantastic. So we're uh, coming to the end now. Um, what are what, what sort of the, the conclusions, the messages I, I, I'd like you to take away? Well, basically, there, there are three. Um, mastery, we learned some new skills, and uh, I'm sure all of us have improved and learned a lot from the trip. Miracle, almost everything worked, um, and um, all the transport connections worked, even the slightly complex one on the way back, where which involved uh, Miquelon to St. Pierre, St. Pierre to St. John, St. John's to Halifax, Halifax to Heathrow, uh, four different time zones involved, and not great t amount of time for changing planes in some of the places. Um, it all worked and that's really thanks to Martin, excellent planning and having these backup scenarios, what happens if it's misty, will the flights work at the right time to be able to get the boat uh, as an alternative option. So uh, thanks Martin for all that planning that went into that. Um, 
And uh, sorry, and the final one was mobilisation. Um, we're all eager to get away to somewhere next. Don't know where yet. Um, we will, most of us, be on the Camham trip to uh, uh, next April uh, to the Scottish Islands. Um, but we will have to see where the next CWS trip will take us. So uh, that's it. All that remains now is the QSL card is off to the printer very, very shortly indeed and we will get the QSL cards out as soon as possible. So thanks very much. I reckon we have five minutes for questions. Can I just thank the Rumble team for waiting till I got back for the activity? <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, any questions? What's the budget like? What's the budget like? Okay, um, I reckon it's uh, probably fair to say it was about a thousand pounds a head. Yeah, <laughs> eleven hundred, something like that. Um, obviously, the flight's the main expense there. We had one current student of the university with us, and fortunately, he was able to get a travel grant from the university to cover some of that. Um, and uh, otherwise, expenses were biased, sort of uh, in his favour, shall we say? But, uh, but yes, it, was, it worked out to about eleven hundred pounds a head. The motel was what two hundred fifty-five euros. Yeah. The, the motel was fantastic value, and uh, even, even we, we ate at the motel three, three of the nights we were there. Food was excellent and didn't cost anything at all, basically. It was, um, it was really good. What kind of did take euros on the island? Yes, the, the island does, if part of France, it does use euros. Anything else from anyone? Did you pour stuff nicely back in the cupboard nice and tidy after you left? Yes, we did, yes. Um, and uh, there is... Uh, Did you put any mice to fire? Oh, it's yours. Yes. Oh. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so the the, um, the, the Step IR vertical is still out on the beach because it will be used by the CQ or White team yeah. at the end of at the end of October, um, and they they will almost certainly take it down. We um, we had to do a, a quick um, modification. To, well, get get the motor working again. Um, it's uh, it has seized up a bit, but well, um, it was cable. Fault. Uh, it was cable. Sorry. Cable force me in. Right. Okay. Um, I, I think I was operating at the time it was fixed. So I didn't hear the full story, but. Um, but yes, we yeah, at least four years now, it's done very well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 no problem with the tool. So, so yeah, I thought that was excellent. Uh, thanks for that. And uh, yeah, so we, we left some more and some more verticals and some yeah, more. Two more glass poles, two more runs of coax and some more wire. Yeah. yeah. So there, there, there's even more stuff now in store we've covered. We we have we have, we have the current copy of the inventory, we'll get that to the guys who are going out to see your and then hopefully carry on cir circulating. <coughs> um, I, I just would like to applaud the way you brought this into focus for non amateurs I, and you know, with a view to getting more people into the hobby life, that's absolutely great. Well, thank you very much. Obviously, the, the TV report did help on that, and we were very fortunate that happened. But um, I, it, it's easy. It, we've got these social media tools out there. It, there's absolutely no difficulty to do it at all. It requires very little time investment to do it. And it's, it's, it's a great way of getting people involved. Okay. Is there a radio in the store cupboard? Uh, there, there is not currently a radio in the store cupboard. It's something that uh, we are investigating. Okay. There, there is a linear amp, by the way, the LTG kit linear amp. Just needs a small radio something, and then you've got. You've yeah, got, 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 yeah. got a station, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yes. So you need to put it Carry on back. Yeah, I, as, I mean, we, as I say, we had a 706 and an IC7000 with us. You know, both of those are really small, yeah. nice mobile rigs. Um, K3 yeah. was in my carry on. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a 450. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, all the radio. Do you think Dunstanfield went into it? Yeah, we had Dunstars, the, the CWS uh, set of Dunstars we used for um, contesting. They are essential, that's all they do. Yeah. Kind of yeah, exactly. Anything else? No? Okay, well, thank you very much for coming, and uh, if you have any problems, uh, feel free to ask any of us uh, offline. Thanks. Yeah.